Let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter number 55. This is our lectionary passage for the day, and uh, I am always blessed by this particular passage of Scripture that uh, continues to create for all of us a reminder, uh, particularly as we go through seasons of consecration, seasons of, of Lent, seasons of fasting and praying. Uh, it does remind us of this awesome and important opportunity uh, to seek the Lord while the Lord may be found, uh, to do what we can to make sure that God's presence is not elusive. It is not beyond our senses. It is not beyond our grasp. And as we find ourselves on a countdown to Resurrection Sunday, on a countdown to the Easter uh, liturgical celebration, I want you and I and all of us to be mindful uh, that there is a need for us to prepare ourselves for God's arrival, God's resurrection, God's power that is always breaking into our lives. And Isaiah is speaking to a group of folks, uh, dare I say, uh, the children of Israel who have indeed made it uh, through a time of exile and are trying to put back together a life that pre-exile felt so taken for granted. Uh, they, they, they had their rituals, they had uh, their worship of God. They had gotten at ease, some would say, in Zion. They uh, kind of forgot their covenant responsibilities. And, and when they got thrust into exile, when their enemies overtook them and overcame them, and they spent literally hundreds of years under the thumb of a foreign leader, a foreign ruler, uh, they had to figure out, how do I exist in a strange land? And coming out of exile, they were so glad that that part of their journey was over. But how many of you know when you spend a lot of time in a strange land, you kind of take on strange things? Hello, somebody. Amen. You, you start to forget, and you may have to reflect and remember on the way of life that we were called to before exile was thrust upon us. And... You know, part of what I find to be the gift of Lent in a season of resurrection is that it always affords us to ask ourselves, where am I in my journey towards this new life, this new way of living? How is God seeking to break God's self into my very existence? And in that moment in time, what then is God requiring of me, requiring of us? in order to be most faithful. Isaiah 55, I think, comes to us in a very important and very uh, 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 critical season of our journey. And this is what the first uh, eight verses declare to us. Listen, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. For why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Verse number four says, see, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the people. And see, you shall call nations that you do not know and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Verse number six, seek the Lord while the Lord may be found. Call upon the Lord while the Lord is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that the Lord may have mercy on them and to our God. For our God will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to take a few moments to uh, speak and preach on the topic simply curb our enthusiasm. 
curb our enthusiasm. Come on, let's take a few moments and pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you that you continue to give to us uh, food, spiritual food, food that uh, ministers to our spirit, ministers to our heart, ministers to our mind, and ministers to our soul. Bless me as your preacher today. Hide me behind your cross. And please send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and your hearers today. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. All right. Amen. Uh, I am uh, so grateful for the opportunity to uh, proclaim the word of God to you this morning. Um, you know, sometimes uh, we may take these moments and opportunities for granted. Uh, but I have found that there is a great gift in being able to declare what thus says the Lord. And this is what I believe the word of the Lord is speaking to us today, a word that is inviting us to think deeply about our enthusiasms, the things that uh, we are animated by, the things that uh, cause us to have uh, certain impulses and certain desires, the things that drive our decisions and, dare I say, the trajectory of our lives. As I was thinking about uh, our enthusiasms, as I was thinking about uh, the ways in which we acquire taste for things, um, I, I, I uh, was reflecting on um, a, a little bit more biology. If you hear last week, I, I did a little biology about about uh, uh, butterflies and, and caterpillars and, and larvae, and, 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 and I'm, I'm still in my biology bag, praise God, uh, talking about our taste buds this morning and how, as human beings, we are all born, it is said, with about 10,000 taste buds uh, that are situated largely on our tongue and that these taste buds help us distinguish between what is sweet, what is sour, what is salty, what is bitter, and what is, uh, the word is uh, umami, which is kind of the things that help you distinguish meat, I believe. And, and, and all of these taste buds over the course of your life, uh, they continue to help you make meaning of so much. And, and we can go to your other senses. We can go to your smell, which your taste buds are often closely connected to through the neural pathways of our brains. That God has hooked up our senses in such a way that they help us make sense of our world. But they also help you and I uh, become quite prone to certain kinds of sensations and desires. Uh, that your taste buds remind you when you put something in your mouth, if you like it or not. Your taste buds help you to uh, be safe from uh, burning your mouth uh, if it is too hot or freezing your mouth if it is too cold. That your taste buds are a biological gift from God that help protect you, but also at the same time, help bring pleasure and purpose to your life. Now, it's so fascinating because, uh, you know, there are things external to you that could cause you to lose taste in your taste buds. Viral infections, which uh, we know many of us who have had COVID or have known a family member with COVID knows that one of the, the earliest signs is you lose taste in your mouth and the sense of smell. That viral infections, medical conditions, nutrient deficiencies, deficiencies like if you don't uh, uh, take enough vitamin A, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, zinc and copper, that it could literally cause the taste in your mouth to lose the force through its taste buds. I'm just giving you a little biology lesson, amen. Some of y'all need to take some, some vitamins every, every, every day, praise God. Uh, nerve damage, that nerves found along the pathway from the mouth to the brain, when damage can cause you to lose taste in your mouth. That 
uh, 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 medications, taking certain kinds of medicines, antidepressants, antibiotics, antifungals, antihistamines, antivirals, diuretics, muscle relaxants, thyroid medications, all these things over time can cause you to lose your taste buds. Aging, that the older you get, uh, your taste buds, they just begin to decrease, particularly when you hit middle age. And smoking, the injection of some of these foreign chemicals in your body uh, can cause you, because of the carcinogens and the alkaloids, can cause you to lose taste in your mouth. And I, I was thinking about this idea that for many of us, we may have lost taste or we may have grown to like too much of a thing. And wherever you are in this journey, I want you to know, child of God, that there is always an important moment in our lives where we are to ask ourselves, God, in light of what you have done, in light of what you are doing, in light of who you are, where are my enthusiasms, the things that I have grown to love, to depend on, where are these things in need of a bit of check? Where must I start asking myself, God, how can I learn to recapture or to lose a bit the taste, the enthusiasms, dare I say, the impulses for things that are not fully life-giving to me? If I had some real folks this morning, I think some of you uh, would be honest to say that one of the hardest things to do is to curb your desire or your impulses away from things that you've become used to satiating. Uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, uh, uh, I, 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 I've been on a workout regimen with Brother Anthony, and, and, and the, the, the more I work out, uh, the, the less I like to eat certain foods. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because I, I've, I've learned a thing about calorie intake. Praise God. And so while it may taste good to my tongue, it may not feel good to my body. Amen. Especially when I got to drop and do burpees and, 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 and run for hours at a time. Praise God. Uh -huh, that there are moments where my tastes are not always good for the goals I have. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk a little real to some of us today. Uh, any of you ever fell in love with a way of living or a way of existing that is not healthy for you? Uh huh. Maybe it's your life work balance. Maybe it's your relationship with your family members or co-workers or your partner or your friend, your spouse, your children. Whatever the case may be, there are some enthusiasms for which we've become addicted to. Some ways of life, of living that are requiring us to, to, to interrogate. I recall my work in addition studies when I was uh, doing my undergrad, and, and it was fascinating because we learned how our bodies are wired for addiction. That our mind plus our desires coupled with our senses, our mind with our desires coupled with our senses can create all kinds of pathways to both healthy kinds of ways of living and unhealthy kinds of ways of living. And addiction is not necessarily a bad thing if you're addicted to healthy ways of living. Somebody say amen. Amen. If you are addicted to eating healthy, then you, on, you, on, you, you got some good addictions going on in your life. If you're addicted to loving folk and forgiving folk, you got some good addictions going on in your life. If you're addicted to, you know, you know, uh, uh, being charitable and, 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 and not, not being greedy, you got some good addictions going on in your life. But how many of you can be honest that uh, all of the addictions I have in my life are not always wholesome for me? Amen. I know we've been going a little while, amen, but it's still true. Give your neighbor a high five, a little virtual high five, and tell them, hey, amen, I, I need to check my addictions this morning. And, and I want you to know, child of God, that, that when you and I are in need of God to hit some reset buttons in our lives, this is where the season of Lent or consecrations or fasts are very important for us because our bodies can get used to a certain way of life. 
Our minds can get used to a certain way of life. Our politics, our treatment of others, our, our, our assumptions can become so autopilot that we don't interrogate. Uh, am I enthusiastic about this thing in a way that pleases God? The disciplines of Christian faith are always intended to be the toolkit we use so we do not fall into the subjectivity or self-deluding ways of making sense of all of our enthusiasms. How many of you know sometimes you can feel like everything you do, you have a great rationale for it? <laughs> Touch your neighbor, amen, somebody. Amen, I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe it's just me, but you know, uh, much of the things I do, whether they are mistake or error-free, I have a good rationale for it. Amen. You know, well, you know, they did cut me off. So, you know, it was all right for me to, you know, get in front of them and slam my brakes on just to teach them a lesson. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Or, you know, they, they, they didn't do they, they part of this thing at the job. So it was a good idea for me, you know, just to throw them under the bus every chance I got. Or, you know, you know, they did treat me poorly uh, in this relationship. So it, it's, it's a good idea for me to return that poor treatment to this person or the next person. Whereas God is actually calling you and I to a higher way of living. And Lent, this season, we are being invited. The scripture starts off and says, listen, everyone, somebody say everyone. Everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. That in many respects, we are always being invited by God. No matter where we are on our journey with God, to come back to the waters and seek a refreshing of sorts that helps to make sure our enthusiasms, our impulses, and our practices are always giving glory to God and always producing life for those around us and even ourselves. Amen. I want you to know, child of God, that it is so important for you and I to never turn down an invitation when God begins to extend one to us. God will always be inviting you and I to literally curb, to, to, to repent, to make a U-turn away from certain ways of life. And you and I can never take for granted that I don't ever need to take the invitation from God to curb my enthusiasms. You and I can never take for granted that because I'm the pastor, I'm the preacher, because you've been saved a long time. You're the worship leader. Amen. You're the prayer warrior. You're the, the auntie and the uncle. You're the mother and the bishop. That God is not always inviting us to curb our enthusiasms. Because it is in the curbing of our enthusiasms that we begin to literally find our lives back in right alignment with God. And, you know, if, if a car needs to go to the shop to get realigned from time to time, <laughs> if your teeth need to go to the dentist to get straightened some of the time, if we in our own human bodies need to go to the doctor and get a checkup and get an external, you know, independent party to give us a clean or not so clean bill of health. How many of you know we always need God to invite us into a place where our enthusiasms can be curbed? And this is where our text becomes so important for us in the season of Lent for literally millennia. Followers of Jesus, as they've approached Resurrection Sunday and Easter Sunday, have always been asking themselves, what does it require of me to be ready for resurrection? Just like we get ready for Christmas, praise God. And there's a countdown to Christmas. Everybody's ready for that because it seems like I'm going to get something out of this thing at the end. Amen. When December 25th hits, amen, I know there's a present or two. Somebody, at least one person in the world loves me. And so I'm getting ready for my present. But how many know Easter may be just as, if not more important than this day that we celebrate in our liturgical calendar? Why? Because although we all have the gift of life, resurrection reminds us that death never has the final say. I don't know about you, but I'm glad about the beginning, but I'm also thankful and hopeful about an end that never ends. 
an end that always produces a new beginning. How many know resurrection is the promise that life can begin anew again and again and again. Resurrection is like a little cheat code for Christmas. Amen. Some of us worried about, you know, uh, Christmas coming in April or something. Christmas coming in May and Christmas coming in June. I say resurrection says that Christmas can come every day. That God can bring us back alive. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, so here we go. We, we have several things that I, I like the scriptures uh, to lift up for us. The first thing that the scripture invites us, if we are going to curb our enthusiasms, if we are going to be serious about using and allowing Lent to be an opportunity for us to, to make sure we are in right alignment. Verse number two says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy. The first thing that I think the scripture lifts up for you and I who are serious about curbing our enthusiasm is we must always be in a positionality of reflection. Somebody holler reflection. Tell your neighbor, reflect. Amen. Reflect, reflect, reflect. Amen. Means that you must literally be in a posture where you are you are in a give and take you are are receiving information but then you're also allowing that to bounce back off of you in a way that keeps you in the in a, in a place of measurement in a place of evaluation sometimes many of us are not good at reflection because we lack self-awareness <laughs> Amen. We, 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 we feel like reflection is a, is a one-way street. But how many of you know that reflection is a reciprocal, ongoing process? And we must ask ourselves, what is it about our participation in the world, in this culture, in the, in the lives that we live, that cause us to literally take on ways of living? that do not always honor God. It asks you and I to be reflective about the ways in which our current modes of consumption, they reinforce the unhealthy lifestyles. Our current modes of buying and selling and participating in the capitalistic economy of the West, it, it predisposes us to a transactional way of life. Meaning that if I can't get anything out of this, then I'm not going to put anything into it. It makes you always ask yourself about the value factor versus the impact factor. It makes you continuously buy in to these ways of consuming information or producing your labor, as the scripture says, in ways that do not Create satisfaction. And I wonder, child of God, how often we reflect on these things. Amen. Because, you know, the, 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 the trick of this country, this world, this culture is to keep us so busy that we have no time for reflection. That, that is why I love the Catholic kinds of uh, mo monastic traditions, because, you know, uh, they say, yeah, I'm going to pull out of the rhythm of this world. And I'm just going to spend a week in silence. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't going to just say a word. Amen. Some of us, we, we couldn't do that for five minutes. Amen. We, you know, you know, uh, I, when, I, when I was growing up, you know, I, I was telling some folks I was in Oklahoma City this week, and they were like, oh, you must have just been a great child your whole life. I said, well, I was so great that my parents used to tell me, keep my hands in my pockets when we, when we went in the stores. Amen. Because, you know, my hands were busy and sticky, praise God. I would pull shelves down. I would, I would play with toys and forget to put them on the thing. And I would get lost in department stores. And, and so I had to peep my hands in my pockets. Why? Because there was something inside of me that, you know, even as a child, uh, you know, I didn't know I was conceived in iniquity. Praise God. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, somebody. Amen, amen, amen. That, 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 that sometimes you and I, we, we can often participate in this culture and not 
be reflective. And we need the models and the disciplines of the saints, of, 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 of the monastics, of, of these individuals who are not perfect in their own being or way of life. But they point us. They remind us that it's important to practice the presence of God. It's important for us to look around in nature and see God's presence when the ugliness of, of, of human uh, stewardship of creation robs us of God's beauty in the world. It's important for us to fast from time to time. It's important for us to do acts of charity even when you don't feel like you have enough. Why? Because these practices force you and I into a place of reflection. And I want you to know, child of God, it is a condemnation on we as the church if we cannot reflect on the ways in which we are thirsty, but we still won't come to the waters. We are hungry, but we still will not buy and eat at the, at the deli of the creator. That we are people who know we have no money, but yet we still won't come and participate in the economy of God that does not require you and I to have wealth, riches at all. So the question I want you and I to think about in our reflection is what is it that seduces us to participate in a way of life that is grounded in scarcity and unfulfillment? Lent is a good opportunity, a good time to ask yourself, what is it about this life that I have opted into that causes me to work so hard but get so little? To buy so much but own very little? To, 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 to literally invest my whole life in the enterprise of this world and still when I'm in the final Weeks and months of my life, this same world won't even extend health care to me so I can have comfort and medical care. Child of God, reflecting on this moment then leads us to the next point that the scripture says. Verse number seven, then that the wicked must forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts and that they may return to the Lord so the Lord may have mercy on them and return to God for God will abundantly pardon that if we are in a place of reflection uh, then it automatically leads us to a place of repentance and return and I want you to always remember that God pulling us into reflection is not a permanent posture sometimes you can be reflective too long and become paralyzed by your reflection when God is actually bringing you to this place so that you can kind of return and repent back into right relationship with God. And there is a, a, a need for repentance in our country. There is a need for repentance in our families and in ourselves. That, that repentance is the U-turn we must make. It is the radical kind of returning to the ways of Jesus. It is us acknowledging that, Jesus, you have a way. But for some reason, I've gotten a little off track. And Lent is the invitation for us to get back on track. Lent is the invitation for us to acknowledge that uh, my ways have kind of gotten a little off course. And Lynn is also the opportunity for we, the church, because we're doing it as a collective, right? To remind ourselves that we exist in the world as salt and light. And so our influence in the world must also be reflective of what God is calling us to repent and return toward. The act of repentance should not be uh, or should be always accompanied by a return to the ways of Jesus. But we must not reduce repentance to an individualistic, moral, and pietistic endeavor. Meaning that repentance for you is just your list of sins, the ten top sins that you don't struggle with. And you build your whole, your whole you know, evaluation off of the things that you don't struggle with. You know, uh, when, 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 if I were to call a fast uh, uh, for peanut butter, praise God, there would be no struggle for me. Because I'm allergic to peanut butter, amen. 
I don't eat peanut butter anytime. Amen. They, you know, some folk uh, who are vegetarians and we call the Daniel fast and, and they just be like, all right, well, I guess there's nothing that I need to struggle with during this fast. No, there's always something that we are called to literally wrestle with, but that is just a small part of repentance. We must always embrace that. Repentance has a social and a communal call as well. So we hold our individual lives along with the social cause of repentance, and we literally make a left foot, right foot journey into faithfulness. And this is why I find such schizophrenic or uneven expressions of Christian faith in our country. Because some would love to make their faith all about their behavior, personal behavior, personal vices, but not about how they treat all of creation, the others whom God has created. And then you have those who want to focus on creation and the other folk external to them that God has created, but not be honest and serious about the work that must be done in our own hearts. And so the Lent season, I'm just telling you, is giving us an opportunity to repent from the ways in which we pursue our own interests. We embrace our own ways of thinking and living apart from God. Racism, we must repent from racism and return to the radical inclusivity of God in creation. Exclusion, we must repent from exclusion and expand the circle of belonging so everybody feels like and knows that they have a seat at God's table. We must, in this season of war, where we hear people openly talking about assassinations of world leaders and we see despots literally invading countries. We see our own tax dollars dropping bombs on Somalia and Yemen while we denounce the war in Ukraine. We are a complicated, conflicted people. And yet I want you to know that there are Christians in in, in Yemen, there are Christians in Somalia, there are Christians in, 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 in Ukraine. And guess what? Even if there were no Christians, the Christians here ought to be people who are known for ending and studying war no more. But why is it that for many of us, that's such a hard thing? Amen. So many of our decisions are left uninterrogated and overdetermined by the way we have come to hear or learn about Christ in the imperialistic country called the United States of America. But how many of you know uh, Jesus was working in every continent before America came to be? <laughs> Touch your neighbor, amen. I know Jesus was in Africa before the United States came. Jesus was in Asia, amen. Jesus in South America. Je Jesus was everywhere before the United States came. So could you imagine there may be a way of following Jesus more faithfully than the imperialistic slave holding a world-dominating United States of America? And I don't mean no harm, except I do, praise God. That we must repent and return. And finally, child of God, repenting and returning means that we must retrain ourselves. Somebody say retrain, not train. I'm not talking about you train and I'm talking about retrain, which means that you may have to do some things that help you to unlearn or override some things you've learned. Jesus or the scripture says in verse number nine, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts that are higher than your thoughts. That how many of you know sometimes uh, the ways of God are so on another level that just because you get a hold of some some of God, you know, when you were 30, praise God. How many know that just like your body is regenerating every seven to 10 years, every cell in your body is, is literally being reborn anew that you may be graduating to a new kind of revelation with God that you may not have gotten when you were a little younger 
And sometimes these new ways of thinking, they will cause your taste buds to have to be checked. They will cause your enthusiasm to have to be interrogated. They may require your brain to have to be retrained. Uh, that's why the scripture says that you and I ought to be transformed by the renewing of our mind uh, that God literally wants to renew your mind God wants to retrain you God wants to make the things that you thought were taken for granted and cause you to engage in some exercises that can actually animate uh, the eternal sensibilities uh, of your senses uh, you may have grown up uh, being trained to not like vegetables uh, uh -huh, but there is a diet that you can participate in uh, that can lower your cholesterol all level. I wish I had a church. Uh, amen. I heard it said before that the reason why some of us like McDonald's so much uh, is because they put a little enzyme in the food that causes your taste buds uh, to literally crave that which is literal death. Uh, and so we'll eat all this chemical food uh, and wonder why am I still hungry uh, after I done filled up with food uh, that don't never decompose. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I just dare you do a little experiment. Uh, take one of your fries uh, and just put it on your counter uh, and set it next to a real-life potato uh, and see which one uh, begins to decompose before the other. Uh, I guarantee you ain't eating no fresh potatoes uh, more than you eating them McDonald's fries. Uh, how many of you know some of us uh, have gotten addicted to tasting and liking death uh, when God is trying to get you to curb your desires uh, so we can love life uh, we can love hope uh, we can love love uh, and power in the holy ghost uh, somebody shout hallelujah and that is why we always see God inviting us uh, into this Eucharistic banquet fellowship. Uh, this fellowship where we have a table that is spread before God's people. Uh, and God will always spread a table uh, that has everything that you and I need to live. Uh, and God will always spread a table uh, that never is defined by scarcity. Uh, God will always spread a table uh, that invites all who are thirsty and all who are hungry uh, to come drink and buy uh, and get everything uh, that you could ever need. Uh, but the one thing I like about the table uh, is that the meal will get so great and grand uh, that other folks will be watching how you eat uh, and they'll be watching how you fellowship uh, and they'll be watching how you live uh, and they'll be running to the table. Uh, saying is there room for me your job child of God is not to be stingy with your seat talking about I'm saving this seat for somebody else when in reality it ain't your seat that seat belongs to God it belongs to the one who made the invitation and I heard a word from the Lord that said come all who are weary and heavy laden come sit down at the table come come and drink the wine come come and eat the bread come on bring your broken heart come on bring your troubled mind come on Bring your trauma and your pain and watch me do a new thing. Watch me bring you back. Watch me heal your body. Watch me save your soul. Watch me cast out the devil. Curb your enthusiasm. Why? Because God wants to do something in us. Stand with me, everybody. That allows us to experience life and life abundantly.
Oh, yes, child of God, we got to do some reflecting. Reflecting on God, why do I participate in these ways of life that clearly do not bring me satisfaction? Hallelujah. Why do I work myself in this deadly capitalistic economic death machine? Rather than trusting that God and God's people and the world we create together will outlast the failing empires of the world. I was in Oklahoma City. You know, Oklahoma's known to be in a pretty, you know, Bible Belt, Republican-leaning, Trump-endorsing state. And, you know, we in California, that is, you know, not considered Bible Belt, blue-leaning, anti-Trump state, but still full of the devil. I mean, the devil's everywhere. California, Oklahoma, pick one. <laughs> but, but you know, as I was there, I was having a conversation in a restaurant, and someone was asking me about a comment I made in one of my trainings about how all nations fall. There is no nation in the history of the world that has persisted without end, that every nation falls, every empire falls, every human constructed government falls. But the only thing that outlasts nations and governments are people. And why would our loyalty be to governments that fall when the people are who we are called to love. Sometimes we gotta ask ourselves, what am I being invited into? In a time where I heard someone on TV say we may be on the brink of a third world war. I'm asking myself, who are we at war with? But the forces of wickedness that seek to own that which is not theirs to own. What must we repent from? What must we return back to God? How must I retrain? We retrain ourselves. I'm so glad that there is no way of thinking that cannot be retrained. There is no way of living that cannot be retrained. There is no way of believing that cannot be retrained. So lift those hands to the Lord real quick, right where you are. Whether you're here or at your home, it's me, O oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it's not my father, my sister, or my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you. I need you, O oh God, to curb my enthusiasms. Lord God, I invite you, O oh God, to put a check on the very things that I am enthusiastic about that I lend my time to, my loyalties to, my, my sensibilities to check those things, God, so I can be more loving and more pleasing, that I can be a healed and whole person, that I can be a faithful follower of you in unfaithful times. Help me, God, to say I'm sorry where I must say I'm sorry. Help me, Lord, to retrain where I must be retrained. Help me, oh God, to walk anew where I must walk anew. Help me to reject, Lord God, the old ways of thinking and living, oh God, that invite death itself into my family and into my community. Help me, oh God, even during this season of COVID, to continue to be a good steward over my body. Lord God, may I, Lord, be a steward over that which you've given to me with faithfulness and gentleness in Jesus' name. And Lord, I know that you're able to do this thing because you saved me. Anybody glad that God saved you one day? Amen. There may be some here today, you're not saved. You haven't yet given your life to God. You have not yet made the ultimate, most best decision to begin in the ways of Jesus. I want you to know that all it takes is one step. All it takes is a U-turn. All it takes is for you to say, I've been going in one direction and now I need to go in another direction. It doesn't take a whole lot. It just takes your mind saying yes to God. Your heart 
saying yes to God, your soul, your spirit being open to God. Why? Because God calls you. God calls us all of the time. The invitation does not have an expiration date on it. The invitation does not have an RSVP by date on it. But it's always inviting us. If you need salvation, I dare you just to lift your hands right where you stand and say, God, save me. God, take me. God, deliver me. God, make me yours. Because I'm available to you, God. I'm available to your ways. I'm available to your truths. I'm available to all that you will do. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm curbing my enthusiasms today. God bless you, people of the way. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Praise. Whether you're in the house or in the sanctuary virtually, we say thank you, God. Thank you, God, for curbing our enthusiasms in Jesus' name. Well, God bless you, people of the way. We love you so much with the love of the Lord. We